Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. My name is Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium. And today we're gonna to keep talking about power integrity and we're gonna get uh, into a, a little bit of a topic that is a continuation of the previous video where we talked about ferrites being put on the output of a power regulator that's being used to supply power to digital integrated circuits. You shouldn't do that and we explained why in the previous video. There's an argument for why you should do it and so we're gonna explore that in this video. Let's get into it. So there's one search term on the internet I found long ago, and that term is decoupling inductor. Decoupling inductor. What does that mean? Well, what they're referring to when someone uses this term, and it's not a very common term, so you won't hear it very often, but there is an argument for this. What this means when this term is used is the use of additional inductance in the power delivery network to try and stabilize the power output from a regulator. So in the previous video, I drew this big messy diagram, but the point here was to show that when I have a regulator connected to an integrated circuit that is on uh, you know, just kind of your vanilla four layer board with a power and a ground plane, I actually don't want to use a ferrite here on the output to try and dampen any sort of noise that's on the power output. The only counter argument that I've seen to this, aside from low pass filtering, does get closer to the way capacitors actually function. And it relates to how capacitors can also act like inductors when they are uh, excited at sufficiently high frequencies. So I wanna get into this a little bit deeper because it is actually an interesting argument and there's a little bit of circuit analysis involved to see why it might or might not be okay to use an inductor somewhere in series on the power delivery network. So let me clear off the board and we'll get started. First, what I wanna do is just look at the typical structure of a power delivery network. It doesn't matter if it's a four layer, two layer, 10 layer PCB. The general equivalent circuit that you can use to model a power delivery network looks something like this. So I've got my source voltage that is being output to my PDN. Uh, here I've got some DC resistance from the plane that makes up the, uh, the power plane. It's not zero resistance just because copper has, you know, finite conductivity. And then I have my bank of capacitors. So this could be uh, decoupling capacitor one. Here I'm going to, let's say, decoupling capacitor two. Hope you all enjoy my uh, very messy drawing here. And then there's these resistances in between each of these elements. And this just keeps going on and on for as many uh, decoupling capacitors as you have. And I'm just gonna limit it to two for the moment. And then you have your plane capacitance. Your plane capacitance here, also modeled as a very large capacitor. All of this is in a uh, kind of an R, uh, lumped RC uh, uh, network. And then eventually you get to your output, plus and minus. And so this will connect to your integrated circuits. Here, this is your plane capacitance. And so this is really a simplified model of what happens in the PDN. In reality, there's already some inductance in the power delivery network. Each of these sections of line here, uh, where we have uh, the conductor in, uh, in between each of these capacitors, this actually has some inductance. And so does this one. So here I'll write L here. This also has some inductance, and this also has some inductance. So all of these different elements combined, we have our Ls, we have our Rs, and we have our Cs that combine to give us a very complicated impedance function as a function of frequency. If you look in the frequency domain and you calculate or measure the impedance of this structure, it actually looks something kind of like this. So it does these kind of waves and then eventually goes up and goes back high again. This level down here that you'd like to get to is ideally less than one milliohm. You wanna try and keep this PDN impedance as low as possible. This spectrum here that you see, uh, these peaks are entirely defined by what happens in your capacitors as well as the other parasitic elements. So the parasitic uh, L and the parasitic R and then also the plane capacitance. And all of that combines and lumps together to give you uh, this very complicated impedance function uh, that you see in the frequency domain. How does this relate back to adding some inductance? Well, there are two perspectives to look at this. And if you wanna add some inductance 
One reason that is sometimes cited to do this is to try and change the location of one of these peaks. So maybe move it out to higher or lower frequency. If you're dealing with digital signals, don't do that. The reason is that a digital signal has its power concentrated from DC all the way up to very high frequencies. My uh, digital signal will have power concentrated throughout this really broad range of frequencies. So it doesn't really matter if you move this left or right. If I move this peak around somewhere by adding or moving or removing some inductance, um, it's still gonna get excited by my digital signal because my digital signal's power spectrum overlaps with the impedance spectrum. And so that's how I know I'm still gonna excite this very noisy voltage waveform that we had referenced earlier. Just to, to remind you, this uh, voltage waveform could look, you know, something like this. And I've drawn this intentionally because this is now where we get into the alternative argument for using an inductor or adding inductance somewhere in the PDN to try and dampen noise. The other supposed reason you might wanna do this is to try and change the conditions for damping here in this waveform. So this waveform, this is an underdamped oscillation. So go read about damped oscillations if you're not familiar with this concept already, but this is very important. One of the arguments for adding in some inductance somewhere on the PDN would be to try and change the conditions for this oscillation. So it accepts that the oscillation is always going to occur, and that's true. There will always be some oscillation, but you either want to make the oscillation as small as possible, or you want to change this from underdamped to critically damped, or possibly overdamped. Critically damped would be the ideal case. How do we get to a critically damped oscillation? The, uh, the, the argument for using uh, an inductor is sometimes to place it here, let's say, intentionally placed inductor, we'll call it uh, L1, in between my two capacitors. You can actually calculate and inductance that if chosen just at the right value will create a critically damped oscillation uh, in this circuit. So if you just had a very simple PDN where you had just this decoupling capacitor and just this decoupling capacitor and you had no plane capacitance and you didn't have any of these other inductances around the system, then yes, you could change the condition of oscillation here from this waveform to something that maybe looks a little more like this. So it's a little bit of a gentler bump in the time domain when we're looking at the, volt, the output voltage uh, from these two ports. To do that requires a little bit of circuit analysis and you can actually calculate what the, uh, what the critical uh, inductance is and what this, uh, uh, what this amount of resistance needs to be in order to change the conditions of oscillation from underdamped to critically damped. Now, this isn't actually doable in a real PCB. The reason it's not doable in a real PCB is because number one, in order to get your PDN impedance to be this low, you're not gonna be able to do it with a single capacitor or even two capacitors or even probably four or five capacitors. Typically, you'll see this guideline out there from, I think it originated maybe 20 or 30 years ago about uh, using three capacitors for each integrated circuit to try and provide stable power. And it's uh, Eric Bogatin, who's a well-known signal integrity guy in the industry, calls it the myth of the three capacitors. It's one of those guidelines that I think was fine 20 years ago. We're in 2021 now. It's not fine today. You should actually think about how the capacitors generate this impedance curve in order to make sure that you're providing stable power to your components. Real PDNs, this is not so useful anymore. And uh, it's actually kind of a complicated problem because you now have to consider what the uh, real frequency response is of a capacitor. And that's something that we'll have to get into in another video um, but it's uh, the, the frequency response of a capacitor actually exhibits what's called a self-resonance frequency. And so I'm gonna introduce this concept now because it's gonna be important in the later video. And it's actually really important because it should tell you that all components, I don't care if it's a capacitor or an integrated circuit, will have these problems where even though the component is designed some way, 
it has some additional inductance and some additional resistance and some additional capacitance that you didn't actually intend to be there. Component manufacturers have actually gone to very great lengths to try and set their self-resonant frequencies for their capacitors to different values for different applications. And so you can actually find like ceramic capacitors and film capacitors that have a range of different self-resonance frequencies. And by selecting those capacitors properly and by adding them into the PDN in the right number and with the right capacitance value, you can actually tailor this, uh, this curve here to get to, uh, to a point where you ensure that these peaks are relatively low. Even if there are a large number of them, they're still low enough that if you do excite this underdamped oscillation, it's not going to be so large that it creates a power dropout on your integrated circuits. So the moral of the story here is, and I know I've gone into a lot of different topics because it is a complex topic, but the moral of the story here is this inductor that you might want to put here in between two capacitors, it only works when you actually have two isolated capacitors. And it only works in a very specific case that you don't actually see in reality. It, in other words, it only works on paper. Instead, do the proven method and instead of trying to add in inductance into a, uh, into a power delivery network to try and dampen noise, add in capacitance. This is where we would instead put another capacitor here, put another capacitor here, and so on and so forth down the line. And of course, we want to make sure that we have plain capacitance. This is very important too. Having plain capacitance is really a basic guideline for dealing with digital integrated circuits and it's going to be one of the big things that you need to do to ensure that you provide stable power to those components. Okay everybody, uh, thanks for watching and I hope this information has been really useful. As always, help us hack that YouTube algorithm, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. If you have questions that you want us to address on these videos, leave them in the comments. We'd really love to hear them. They're always fun questions and they're sometimes they're a real challenge to answer, um, but I love doing it. So please feel free to leave your questions in the comments. Also, if you're looking for PCB design software that's gonna help you make sure that you can lay out your boards correctly and help ensure that you provide stable power regulation with a standard stack up that includes the plane layers that you need to have, Use Circuit Maker. It's a great entry level program to help you get started learning PCB design and learning the concepts of PCB design before you move on to something more advanced like Altium Designer. There's a link in the description where you can go check it out. If you want, you can also go sign up for a free trial of Altium Designer. They're both great tools for designers and definitely should be part of your repertoire. All right, everybody, thanks for watching. We'll be back with more videos soon. Don't forget to call your fabricator.